Welcome to the COP26 Nature Newsroom here in Glasgow. Today we are welcoming Simon Zadek, who is the chair of the Finance for Biodiversity Initiative. Simon, we've been working together on the green recovery. Uh, what, is, what are your views now in terms of progress here at COP? We are hearing that there is a lot of progress on mitigation, on forest, but not enough, not enough on finance. What are your views? You know, the world is awash with money. Um, thanks to quantitative easing and low interest rates and you know, ballooning asset prices. And just in the first six months of the pandemic last year, more than $15 trillion were mobilized to protect mainly developed country populations from the economic downside of the pandemic. Now, $15 trillion is a hell of a lot of money. Uh, and in the context of Glasgow, where we're struggling to fill in the gap of just a few billion dollars a year to build trust around a hundred billion dollar commitment from 2009 strikes me quite frankly as a scandal and absurd mm. so clearly the developed countries need to show more solidarity uh, simon you and me were also talking to the g20 italian presidency um, so what do you think could be done then for the G20 leaders to step up and, and support the most vulnerable countries? What is missing there? We all know that you know, the G20 countries account for not just the world's um, global finances, but also account for more than 80% of global emissions, um, both historic and present. Uh, and so although the G20 doesn't have the same legitimacy as the UNFCCC, um, clearly they need to work as a group uh, in advancing more clearly and directly in figuring out their act. And that counts both on the NDC, if you like, mitigation side. Uh, it clearly counts on that symbolic $100 billion a year side. But frankly, it also counts on the broader financing of adaptation and the more contentious issue of loss and damage, which I think is now firmly on the table through Glasgow and simply isn't going to go away. And Simon, uh, last, uh, last night we've heard some news here about this new bilateral, bilateral agreement between the United States and China on enhancing climate action. And it's pretty strong, the text is pretty strong on energy, on reducing methane emissions. Um, and we are thinking that probably the UK presidency is going to take some of this, that language forward. But we're kind of wondering where is the European Union? You know, is, is the EU still a leader on climate action? Uh, we've had the EU Green Deal. How do you see the EU now uh, interacting with uh, China and the US in this final stretch of the negotiations? Can look, the EU deal the finance piece also? Look, you know, the EU tends to put its cards on the table before the negotiation, not during the negotiation, which is sort of a form of leadership but clearly gives them much less leverage when the chips are down and where there's bartering going on. So, so the EU is clearly taking a leadership role, but spends its capital you know, before they get into the room in the main. Uh, clearly the EU can provide that additional capital that's needed for that simple solidarity, $100 billion. It's absurd the idea that it can't do that. Yeah, it's small change by any calculation at all. Uh, and clearly the EU can step up, for example, on much more aggressive action around particularly nature-based aspects such as uh, ridding our value chains of illegal deforestation, something that's more difficult uh, to come out of the US and China. And Simon, with the EU Green Deal, more than 600 billion euros were put on the table for the economic recovery. We've heard that 37% will go to climate, but according to Vivid Economics and many other experts, only 1% is going to nature. So what would be your message to the EU Commission? You know, is the, can the EU really put climate and nature at the heart of the economic recovery? You know, and what would be the conditions to make this a success? Look, one of the most extraordinary things of Glasgow, about Glasgow, and to be honest, previous COPs, is that 
you know, between 25 and 30 trillion dollars a year are spent by sovereigns, so by governments, and it is almost completely absent from any conversation at all of substance, whether you look this year at Glasgow or previous years. The 600 billion that you're referring to in the context of the EU was just nature deficient, there's no doubt about that. Um, but the numbers are actually far broader and we need to bring sovereign finance much more directly into discussion now. We have seen you know, development finance becoming much more part of the conversation about how it can be aligned with climate and nature outcomes and goals. But sovereign finance, except for what are actually fairly modest subsidy levels, is simply not on the table and needs to be going forward. Mm. And Simon, how do you see the role of cities and regions in this systemic transformation? Because it does feel like the EU Green Deal was a very top-down policy process, but it didn't really bring all the lo local actors on board to make the transformation happen. Um, what do you think should be the priorities of cities and regions right now? So, you know, we are all impassioned by the potential of city action. And so one shouldn't neglect it, most certainly. But, but the truth is, is that ambitious action will require more laws, it will require more regulations. And when one looks at the finance space, there is no doubt that a combination of regulation and liability and litigation will be part of the solution and has to come from the national and international level. So action, of course, is possible and necessary at the city and regional level. But changing the rules of the game is something that requires ultimately sovereigns working individually or collectively to act on. So we need COP26 to deliver on finance, national governments to strengthen legislations, and local mayors to take action. Uh, yeah, let me give you perhaps just one example, and I know our time is running short. You know, we have been astonished and pleased by the turn up of the financial community in Glasgow as compared to previous negotiations. And the numbers, of course, are off the charts, $130 trillion and so on and so forth, numbers that none of us can really conceive of. But surely now would be the time to begin to tie in those net zero commitments to financial institutions to legally binding agreements. If those really are agreements, let's embed them in law and ensure that they actually play out. Remember that CEOs average tenure you know, is around five years for major corporations. And although that doesn't make them disingenuous, it means that we have to build regulatory mechanisms to ensure that those net zero outcomes are really delivered on. Thank you, Simon. So let's fund nature and fund the future. Thank you. Absolutely, and thanks to you as well.